Hello, I am Jamila Musaeva, an international social etiquette consultant and the author of the book Etiquette, The Least You Need to Know. Some of you that are already familiar with me, perhaps from a Q&A video or maybe from my previous videos, you know that I'm a mother of two and uh, because I'm also a teacher, I work a lot with kids. Uh, so today's video is dedicated to parenting style or parenting advice and uh, this is a kind of a video that's very personal to me and I would like to share some personal tips that I've acquired over the years um, working with kids and having kids. So if you have kids or if you aspire to have kids, please make sure you watch this video and let me know which of these advices you found the most useful in your application in daily life. If you're new into my channel, make sure that you subscribe and if you're an old subscriber, make sure you like and comment this video. I look forward to hearing more suggestions from you or what kind of topics you would like to see more on my channel. Tip number one is teach your children languages. I have done a video about how I speak five languages fluently and I've been learning them ever since I was a child. If you haven't seen that video, make sure you check it out down in the description box. I'm going to share the link. Learning languages is so important. Uh, I have myself witnessed how it has tremendously affected my life and I tell to everyone, all the parents in school, that you want to make sure that your child speaks at least three languages and the earlier you start, the better off you're going to be. Learning a language is really not about having a pen, a notebook or a write book. It's really about enjoying the process and it doesn't have to have an end and a, you know, a start and an end date. It's a lifelong process because at the point when you stop learning or using the language, it's going to get rusty and over time you're going to lose the vocabulary and maybe over time you're going to forget it altogether. I've seen this happen to a lot of people and that's why I never pressure my child into, you know, learning the language and being able to speak it in a year time or two. I organize some play dates with either the native speakers or I speak to her when I'm bathing her or we're watching a cartoon in French or English or Azerbaijani or Russian. She's now five and a half and I can assure you that she speaks four languages with different levels of course but she's able to understand and have a conversation in all four languages. Sivind, hi. How are you? I'm fine. How old are you Sivind? What are you gonna do now? I'm gonna paint. You're gonna paint, okay. Tu peux m'expliquer ce que tu vas faire? Je vais faire les coquillages. Avec la peau, tu vas les prendre. Et après? Et après, je vais les poser et je vais faire un calier. Très bien. Un petit bastard qui est à coucher. Qui est dans la rue? А с кем ты была утром на пляже? Это с мамой, Джанкой и с папой. Да, молодец. Бессен, о, правильно, вельно не едем, сэр, сэр. Мэм, Стефан. Не, не едем, сэр. Мэм, сэр, Baba, ne yiyin Jason? Mem baba ne? Another important thing that I would like to mention is I let her speak one language up until she was about two years old and once she was firmly speaking one language so she was able to have a basic conversation in one language I started incorporating the rest and the rest started adding all together because I wanted her to be exposed to different kind of uh, languages and different kind of vocabularies Every language is so specific, there are certain notions that only exist in one language. For example, in French, there is the word savoir vivre, which is about knowing how to live, enjoying the life. It's something that's very difficult to translate to any other language. In Azerbaijani, we have other word namus, which is more than just an honor. It's in the honor of the family, the core values of the family that you have to protect. In English, a word like awkward is very difficult to translate to other languages. It's sort of an amalgam of feelings of shyness and 
uncomfortableness. So these kind of words are only in the specific languages and it's very difficult to translate these notions. So when you expose your child to different kind of languages, you let them understand different kind of notions and you broaden their world perspective. They understand different cultures and they're much more aware about the world than if they were to speak only one language. The second tip that goes along with the learning process, it do not expect results immediately, especially with children. I know as adults, we start forgetting the process and we are so focused on the result that we start uh, imprinting the same kind of idea on our children. Let's say if we involve them in center of a club or a class, we expect to get to see results in a given period of time. And as a result, we pressure the child so much that the child stops enjoying the process altogether or might actually get repulsed with the entire process. For example, you enroll your child in a drawing classes and you expect them to be able to draw in a year time. Maybe they won't be able to do that, but because you pressure them so much, they might start hating drawing altogether and never actually taking it on afterwards. So it's important to let it go, to let the child endure the process and results will come, I assure you. To support this point, I want to give an example from my personal experience with my daughter. Uh, when she was little, she really didn't like washing her hair. It was a huge deal for her and naturally she didn't like swimming because her hair would get wet if she had to swim under the water. So it really took us a really long time to get her used to the water. And if I were there standing and expecting her to swim and to really enjoy the process of swimming in like a week or two or even month time, we would drop the class altogether. It took us a year time to get her used to the water and actually enjoy the process of diving under the water and enjoy swimming. A third tip that I want to share with you is read with your child every night. Uh, we've started this ever since she was a little baby and even though she wasn't able to really understand what the reading was about, but made sure that every night we read a book or chapters from a big book. Um, so the process of reading with a child is something that you are incorporating and creating a sort of a tradition around reading. So when the child grows up, the good memories about reading together with a mom or dad will become something that will be associated with reading. So reading will always bring back the sweet memories. Um, in school, sometimes reading is used as a punishment. So let's say if a child is late to class or if a child misses certain homework, they would be assigned reading and they have to read 10 pages or maybe an entire book. So reading becomes associated with punishment. And naturally over time, when the this child goes to become an adult, the reading will not be associated with a good feeling, a good sentiment. Make sure that you tie the reading to a beautiful family tradition and therefore the reading becomes something of a pleasant for a child when he grows up. Tip number four is do not put labels on your child. And I always say this to parents in school as well. And I always say to my colleagues as well, I hate when I hear words like, oh, my child is not good with math or my child is not a math person or my child is not a sports person or my child is not very good with languages. When children hear those labels, especially when they come from people that they love, like their parents or their teachers, even if the child will eventually evolve and become better at certain, that memory will always be with him or her. So do not say that my child is not good with math. You might say my child is better at something and he's working on his math skills, but do not call him a bad at math or a bad at dancing or bad at singing because over time, the child might actually develop those skills, but that label will be stuck in their heads. Professionally, I've seen so many children, really those that were lazy in their middle school, really become such a hard worker in their high school or the other way around. And so uh, labeling a child actually stops them from evolving. Some children might want to make a point and actually prove that you're wrong and really work harder. But for many children, they're gonna really infiltrate their minds and they're gonna really take it to their heart and will stop or give up on trying or turning your perception of them. So please do not label children and actually do not label anyone because people change, people evolve, and that's a natural process of life. Tip number five is distinguish between the person and the action. 
calling a person bad will always remain that like that in their memory they're gonna think of themselves as bad no matter what they do calling an action bad will put the things in the right perspective so for example let's say uh, and one child hit the other one which is a bad thing to do so you might say Jonathan you're a good boy I know you're a kind person but the fact that you hit your friend or hit the other person is a bad action you should not be hitting the other person so making sure that he understands that it's not him who is bad it's the action that's bad will help your child grow and understand the difference between a good action and a good person this i always use as well in my career as a teacher so when i see someone who's not doing his work enough or is not diligent enough i would say you know i name the student and i say you know i know you're much capable of much better if you work harder you're going to deliver so much better results the fact that you're not working and the fact that you're not reading the book or if you're not submitting the work assignment on time shows that you're not dedicating enough time to the studies so your actions are not hardworking. your actions are not diligent it's not you it's the action and that helps the student understand that they really have to get their game together and they really have to work harder and study harder and that again shifts the responsibility back on them speaking of responsibility takes me to my tip number six and that is give them responsibility even when they're very very little make sure you give them some kind of responsibility uh, when my daughter was as young as she was two or three years, I would give her little towels and I would show her how to fold them and she would be folding them, helping me. Or if I was washing the dishes, I would ask her to dry something. So I would give her a little dish of hers and a towel and she would be drying it. Really giving little children responsibility helps them learn independence and helps them understand that helping others is a very important action in life. Tip number seven is get them involved in the sports or any kind of physical activity. And the younger you do that, the better off your child's gonna be. And when I mean sports, I don't mean that enroll them in professional sports or expect them to be some kind of a professional player or a professional ballerina. Really, it's about helping them build their body, helping them build their body as well as build confidence and resilience through sports or any kind of physical activity. When my daughter was very young, uh, I and, and my business partner, we opened the very first and only uh, gym for toddlers and little children in Azerbaijan called Jimbala. Uh, we enrolled children from 15 months old up until seven years, and we helped them through games and all kind of uh, sport activities to develop their body and strengthen their muscles as well as learn about teamwork and help build resilience and help boost their immune system. There are a lot of benefits of early physical activity. You can read about that online. There have been a lot of studies done about that. But what I'm trying to say is that sports has to be a lifelong process as well as a part of lifestyle. So the earlier you get your child involved in the sports, it's going to become a habit of theirs. It's nothing that they have to think about, oh, I'm going to work out for a year and then drop. It really has to be something that they were going to be doing their entire life to help build their body but also help them overcome their fears. A personal story I want to share from our experience in Jimbala. There was this little guy who was very, very sporty, very active, and he was really good at sports, but he had a fear of jumping over the benches. So it actually took three or four months for him to overcome that fear and start jumping over these benches. And then he couldn't stop doing that. He would do that every single training. He enjoyed it so much. It's really uh, true that even the most sporty person or the person who's best at physical activity can have little fears here and there. It might be the fear of jumping or it could be the fear of uh, going up uh, and you know uh, climbing on something. So overcoming these little fears as a child helps you build self-confidence and that is super important. Tip number eight, do not promise something unless you're gonna know that you're gonna do it 100%. And this starts from childhood early on. Um, when my daughter was very little, she would ask me, are we going to have a play date with someone? And if I knew we we're gonna have it, I would tell her. But if I wasn't sure, I would say, I'm not sure, I will have to check to see if they're available because it there was a chance it might get canceled. 
As children, we believe what adults say us. Say if they say they're gonna buy us something, we expect they're gonna do it, and we don't understand when they say they didn't, they didn't do it or they weren't able to buy it. For us, it's like, but you promised. What happened to that promise? So even if it's just a walk to the park, if you promised for your child to go for a walk and then last minute things came up, make sure that you always leave a bit of a doubt and say, you know, I'm not sure if we're gonna be able to do that today. There are chances that I might have work to do, so perhaps tomorrow. But if you say you're gonna do it, even if it's for five minutes, make sure you go down to the park and you have a five minute walk so the child feels like you kept your promise. Because when they grow up, that's gonna be their mindset. If they promise something, they're gonna make sure they're gonna keep the promise. So this is something we learn as children and make sure you stick to your promise as an adult. Tip number nine is teach your child to share. Do it by sharing, but also do it by incorporating them into activity of sharing. The earlier you start, the better off your child is gonna to learn to share as he grows up. So when my child was little, she was only two and a half or three years old, I would do this activity with her where I would collect the toys that she stopped using or she didn't like anymore, she outgrew. The same with her books and clothes. We'd collect it into a bag and then we would donate it together. I wanted her to see where her toys were going. So I wanted her to see the entire process from the start to the end. And I would see how much she got excited by seeing those children that receive those toys get excited by receiving this new collection of toys or books or clothes. So this is something that we have been doing ever since she was little and we're still doing it. And even when I forget about it, she would tell me, mom, you know, I've already accumulated some toys that I stopped using. So perhaps we could collect it and donate it. So now she's the one who initiates this activity. And I love seeing that in her, that she loves sharing. And this is the best beautiful thing that a person could learn to do as a child is learn to share with others what she has. Now that my little boy is growing up, we have started to include him in this activity as well. So he also, looking up to his older sister, he now also comes and brings in the toys that he doesn't want or doesn't play anymore. And he also wants to donate. So I think the older sister is now being the role model in that. And now together we're doing this activity every once in a while to get rid of the things that they're not playing anymore. And so there's room for new things. I always tell my daughter that if you don't get rid of things that either don't spark joy in you anymore or you're not using anymore that might be useful or might be of of a joy to other children then there will be no room for new things in in life for new toys for new books so life is about really getting rid of things that you don't use anymore so there's room for new things in your life the same is true for your outfits the same is true for your books the same is for your relationships in life always make room for new things Tip number 10 is understanding, accepting the fact that there is no one right way of raising a good human being. We all come from different cultures, different traditions, different values, different world understandings. And it's fine because we're so all different and we have so many different views and so many different things to offer to the world. I remember reading myriad of books about raising the perfect child, raising the good child, what do you have to do, so many books on psychology, so different books on advices on parenting styles, and I was so overwhelmed with the information that I had that I always thought there was this guideline that you have to follow in order to make sure you raise a good child. But over time and with experience, I understand that, you know, you're a parent, you're a human being, and so is your child. It's a human being, it's not a machine, it's not a robot that comes with guidelines of how to clean, how to wipe, how to educate. Really, every parent is different and every child is different. So having a clue, a key to your child is important. And that comes with being an intuitive parent by understanding, observing, feeling your child, really, witnessing their their emotions and really feeling their feelings so when you're doing that you're able to tune in with your child and you're able to raise the best child by being the right parent and by saying right i mean the loving parent that they deserve and the the parent that 
is the best for the child that you have and with each child it might be a different parent with one child you might have to be more strict with one child you might have to be more understanding with one child you might have to be more friendly with other one you have to be a bit more of a parent child relationship it's going to be different with every child and it's okay with every child there is its own right way and no one way is the right way Add up on this point, I just want to say that I don't discourage you from reading parenting style books. You want to read them? Go ahead and read them. No knowledge will hurt you. But you have to understand that this is a book and this is a theory that might work for many other children but it might not necessarily work for your specific child. Knowing is good but feeling is much better. So when feeling and knowledge comes together, you're gonna to be the best parent that you can possibly be. Tip number 11 goes along to all the parents that have been stressing out, especially during the times of COVID, when we are stuck in one place with children 24 seven, there's no school, at least in Azerbaijan for now, the schools are closed, so everything is online. And for all the parts of the world that that's the case, I understand that it's very stressful. And as parents, we have to be gentle on ourselves. And we have to understand that any kind of emotion that we are experiencing for that specific day, hour, time, does not have to define us as parents altogether. So if you tend to overreact, that doesn't mean that you have to be that kind of a parent all the time. It's okay to overreact once in a while. You're a human being, you're not a robot. You have to have those emotions to live. So it's okay to be gentle and understanding that it's okay to have that as long as it doesn't become a character of yours. Same applies for, for example, raising your voice to your child. So if you do that once in a while to either make your child hear you or maybe you overreacted or you were stressed out that day, you have to understand that this is normal. All parents around the world experience that. But as long as it doesn't become a character of yours, so you're not a mother who constantly screams, then it's fine to scream once in a while to get your emotions out. You have to be gentle on yourself so when your child grows up, he or she becomes gentle on himself or herself when he or she experiences those emotions as well. Do not suppress them because you're a human and you can show emotions. Tip number 12 is familiarize your child with different cultures, traditions and different kind of countries early childhood on. I have been a huge advocate of that. Uh, as a child, I was fortunate enough to be able to travel a lot with my parents and that's something I value a lot. Uh, the experience that we had together, the exposure I had to the world. And I think it's so important to let your child see that there are different cultures, different languages, different traditions, different notions, and every part of the world is beautiful in its own way. Uh, of course, now with COVID, we're not able to travel as much. Uh, but even so, we have so many online resources. We have YouTube videos about different kinds of countries around the world. We have different television programs, National Geographic to come handy, a lot of textbooks. So make sure you show your child that there are other cultures and other values around the world. So the more you expose them to that, the more open-minded they're going to be as adults. Uh, for example, teach your child that, you know, if they come to India, they have to greet others with Namaste. If they come, for example, to Azerbaijan, then when an elder walks into the room, they have to stand up to greet that person. Uh, in Middle East, you wouldn't hand your business card with your um, left hand. So all these different kind of things that you might want to teach your child, and when I say child, not just the little ones, but also teenagers, you want to show them that there are different kind of cultural uh, traditions and values and customs that they have to be aware of so when they become adults they are more gentle and kind to people that do not share the same values as they do. The final advice that I want to give you and I think that's the most important one that I have now as an adult understood that this was my parents way of infiltrating my mind but I would say this infiltrate your child's mind with good positive words about them say to your child you're a good person you're a kind person you're a humble person you're an empathetic person you're a hard-working person you're an intelligent person say this to your child the earlier you start the more they're going to be hearing this word the more you they're going to grow up thinking of themselves like that kind of a person. I remember as a child, if I would do something wrong, my dad would always say, 
you know, I don't believe my daughter would do that. She's such a good girl and she would never do something like that. Or I know my daughter is a very responsible person. I know she's never going to do something like that. And even if I was a child and I did that, I would feel so guilty for hearing that I would start crying. And they would now retell the stories to me that they would do that so that I will start believing in myself as the kind, gentle, responsible, passionate, whatever that might be, person. And that will be a way I define myself. I want to share my personal life story with you. So maybe that will resonate with a lot of you. Uh, I grew up in Azerbaijan, as I already mentioned. So I graduated school when I was 16. I started school when I was six and because we have 11 years of school, I graduated when I was just 16 years old. So I was the youngest in, you know, in university. And when I got accepted by George Washington University and I decided to go to America to do my bachelor's degree, a lot of my dad's uh, friends were really against that. They would tell my dad that, why do you let your little daughter go to America to study and live there alone? Knowing that I grew up in a quite strict Azerbaijani traditional household, it was a big deal to send a girl to study abroad alone. And my dad would always tell them that, you know what, my daughter is a very responsible, she's a very smart girl and I know she's going to be responsible, she's going to study hard because she's such a hardworking, intelligent young girl. So all these words really infiltrated my mind and really made me always responsible for everything that I did. And a funny story that even when I was in the US, miles and miles away from my dad, his words were in this mind. And whatever I would do, I would always think of my dad. Oh, my dad thinks I'm a responsible person, so I shouldn't do that. My dad thinks I'm a smart girl, so I should study harder. So that always was a kind of a self-control I've had over myself. And now I'm an adult, and I know that my dad has been using that because when I was raising my daughter, he would tell me, you know, tell her she's a smart, responsible girl and she would never, you know, I don't know, touch the brother or beat the brother or do something with her little brother. So she'll always have this sense of responsibility in her head. That worked with me and I'm sure that's going to work with my daughter as well. Uh, it's a positive affirmation that you infiltrate in the mind of a child so much that when they become an adult, it becomes a thing that they're able to control from within. So they become more self-responsible, there's no need to control them anymore, and they become um, affiliated with the words that their parents have defined them to be. I wanted to share this story so you understand that once you identify your child with certain words, they actually live up to those words. So if you call your child lazy, they're gonna live up to that. If you say your child is smart, he or she's gonna live up to that. And that's true not only for children, it's true for everyone around us. Be kind to one another, be kind to your children, be kind to yourself, be kind to people around you, because when you spread that kindness, people around you will turn to become kind to you. Maybe they might not be kind to others, but I guarantee you they're gonna be kind to you. Thank you so much for watching this video until the end. I hope you enjoyed these tips as much as I enjoyed filming this for you. And I hope to see you in my next video. Until then, bye!